Hi everyone, I'm Nelson Burbano and I split my clinical time between pediatric cardiac and adult cardiac anesthesiology at the Cleveland Clinic. Thank you very much to the organizers for the invitation to give this lecture. The title of the presentation is Segmental Approach for Intra-Op Adult Congenital Heart Disease Assessment. These are the goals for the presentation. We are going to start with this clinical case that I'll use as the base of the entire presentation. 40-year-old patient with a very complex cardiac anatomy and disease that includes situs inversus totalis, dextrocardia, of course, congenitally corrected transposition of the great arteries with severe biventricular dysfunction, severe systemic AV valve regurgitation, and other medical issues that you can see in the description. So this patient comes to the OR for an impella placement in, in that systemic right ventricle that is failing. I, I don't know about you, but I find difficult to get a clear understanding of the cardiac anatomy of this patient based on the, on the prior description. Then you start your T examination, and this is probably one of the first images that you are going to get. The anatomy looks very, very abnormal. Then you advance the multiplane some more and get another sort of four chamber view, but it's still very hard to differentiate the, the hard chambers. What is, what is right atrium, what is, what is left ventricle is, is really hard to know. Then you go deep into the stomach and get this view, and then you realize that to make things even more difficult, the liver, which is this one, is in the, in the left side of the patient because of the situs inversus totalis. So the, 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 the T examination for this patient with this anatomy is going to be very challenging. That's why I, I truly believe that the segmental anatomy approach developed by the Vamprax that you see in this picture is extremely useful. It is a simple, straightforward system that helps us understand the cardiac anatomy of even the most complex cardiac defects. They describe the heart based on situs, and you are going to hear this word a lot during the presentation. So this situs has two main components, location or a spatial relationship of the heart chambers to each other and their fundamental chiral characteristics. Chirality implies that each chamber has a unique right or left nature based on its morphology, regardless of where that chamber is located. The Van Prax describe the heart as a series of building blocks with three main cardiac segments, the atria, the ventricles, and the great arteries, and two connected segments, the atrioventricular canal or AV junction, and the infundibulum or conus arteriosus. Due to time constraints, we will concentrate only in the three main cardiac segment, segments. The connecting segments will be a whole different uh, lecture. So they use braces with three letters inside to describe the visceral atrial situs, that's the first letter, the ventricular looping, the second letter, and the great artery situs for the third letter. In short, atria, ventricles, and great arteries are the three main cardiac segments. So we are going to use the usual anatomic orientation from the mesophageal for chamber view to create this drawing. It represents the segmental anatomy system with my own adaptation to match the anatomic orientation of the heart when we see it uh, from the four chamber view during the TE examination. Of course, in a patient with levocardia, the heart will look like this, located more in the left side of the chest. And in a patient with dextrocardia, will look 
more like this, located more on the right side of the chest. However, for simplicity reasons, we will stick to the straight neutral position that does not describe the cardiac position within the chest, it does not. So now let's go over each one of the letters included in the segmental anatomy system. We'll just start with the visceral atrial situs. And we have three options here. Number one here on the left, situs solitus, which is represented with the letter S. It means that all chirally right structures are on the right side of the patient, and all chirally left structures are in the left side of the patient. That includes the abdominal and thoracic organs. Second option, situs inversus, is represented with the letter I. It is a mirror image of situs solitus. That means that all chirally right structures are on the left side of the patient, and all chirally left structures are in the right side of the patient. Third option, situs ambiguous, is represented with the letter A. Ambiguous means that we it's hard for us to know what we are we, we're looking at. We are not sure. It can be at the atrial level that both atria look like right or left atria. This slide shows the three different types of visceral atrial situs: solitus, inversus, and ambiguous. Ambiguous is anything that is different from solitus or inversus, meaning some chirally right structures are on the left and some chirally left structures are on the right. There is a mixing of sidedness or abnormal lateralization. This is also called heterotaxy syndromes. Van Praak uses the terms asplenia, excuse me, Asplenia and polysplenia to differentiate them and others use the terms of left or right isomerism. Well, now let's go over how to use the T examination to figure out the visceral atrial situs, um, situs. So for the abdominal situs, we can use the liver. The video on the left shows the hepatic veins of a patient with a liver that is located on the right side of the patient. And we can verify that very easily by just turning the probe to the right from one of the transgastric views. The video on the right from a transgastric at the base of the, of the RV shows that the liver is located on the right side of the patient and is very closely related to that anatomically right ventricle. To determine the atrial situs, I rely heav heavily on two things, the atrial septum and the morphology of the atrial appendage. Let's start then with the right atrium. The image on the left shows the atrial, the septum secundum from a bicaval view. Remember that the septum secundum or limbus of the fossa ovalis is a right-sided structure. Embryologically, it belongs to the right atrium. And the clip on the right shows, the image on the right, that the right atrial appendage on the right side should look more triangular with a very broad base, a big opening at the base of that right atrium. That is very different from the one on the left. Now let's move to the left atrium. The image on the left shows that the septum, the, 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 again, the septum, the atrial septum, again, from the bicaval view. The septum primum embryologically belongs to the left atrium, and it is a left-sided structure. Now, the image on the right shows that the normal morphology of the left atrial appendage should be elongated, finger-like, with a very narrow base. That's very different from the, from the one on the right. Now, let's go back to our clinical case and apply the previous concepts to this patient. 
The transgastric view of the base of the right ventricle on the left shows that there is almost no, no liver. Here, this is the morphologic right ventricle. You see a trileaflet valve, and there is very little liver. We should be in this image, see a, a lot of liver here close to that right ventricle. Now look at the deep transgastric view. The liver is on the right side of the display, which is the left side of the patient. Of the patient. All that means that most likely the abdominal situs is inversus. This is the original clip that I showed earlier, a four chamber view at zero degrees. We see a very large atrium here and another smaller one there on the right side of the, of the display. Let's, let's concentrate on this part, on the atrial septum to see if we are able to differentiate both atria. The location of the septum primum here on this image suggests that this large cavity is the left atrium and the location of the secundum suggests that this is the right atrium. The, morpholo the morphologic left atrium is located on the right side of the patient. So the, atri the atrial situs seems to be inversus. Next, let's, took, let's, let's look at the atrial appendages. The bicable view on the left shows the SVC draining into this more anterior atrium and the appendage looks more like a right atrial appendage. In this view, the, in this view of the, on the view on the right, the, the large atrium, this one is now located on the opposite side of the display because we went from zero degrees to 130 degrees. The appendage of that very large atrium resembles the finger-like the finger-like morphology of the left atrial appendage. So to conclude this part, we can say that based on the location of the liver, the characteristics of the atrial septum and the morphology of the atrial appendages, the visceral atrial situs is inversus. Second letter, ventricular looping. I'm going to run this very short video to explain the process of ventricular looping. This is the primitive cardiac tube uh, where the blood flows from the venous channels located at the bottom of the image all the way up to the arterial trunks located on, on top. So as the cardiac tube grows rapidly, it loops to one side or the other as it accommodates that extra cardiac mass. So most of the time, this primitive cardiac tube loops to the right side. This is right, this is left, as it is shown in the video. So at the end of this whole process, the morphologically, the morphologic right ventricle is located on the right side of the morphologic left ventricle. When the cardiac tube loops in the opposite direction towards the left, the opposite happens. This right ventricle is going to be now located on the left side of the patient. We have, so for the ventricular looping, we have two options here. When it loops to the right, we use the letter D to represent D looping. And you can see here the location of the two ventricles, right ventricle on the right side of the patient. When it loops to the left, we use the letter L to represent L looping, and it will look like, like this. Now the morphologic right ventricle is located on the left side of the patients. The two ventricles are switched now. After we understand the ventricular looping and that the ventricles can be, can be switched in location, we need to be able to differentiate them morphologically. We can use all these anatomic clues to identify a morphologic right ventricle and these ones on the right for a morphologic left ventricle. However, one of the easiest features to remember is, is what I'm showing here with the arrows. 
the lower or more apical implantation of this valve, the tricuspid valve, compared with the mitral valve. Remember that the general rule is that the AV valve, tricuspid or mitral, they follow, they follow the ventricle wherever the ventricle goes. So this lower valve must be the tricuspid valve, and this one should be the right ventricle. Again, let's go back to our case and apply this concept. The clip on the left shows that this AV valve sits lower, more towards the apex of the heart than the other. So this one must be the tricuspid valve and this is the mitral. Additionally, there, there seems to be like some chordal attachments to the septum. Maybe you can see a little bit of the moderator band here. And this most likely is the anterior papillary muscle of the tricuspid valve. All those are features of a morphologic right ventricle, which is located on the right side of the patient uh, due to uh, the looping. The clip on the right shows that the jet of regurgitation corresponds to tricuspid regurgitation because this is the right ventricle. Very good. Moving to the third letter, the great arteriocytes. There are four options here on this section. First, solitus or normal. Again, represented with the letter S. But the following three criteria need to be present for us to be able to say that the situs of the great arteries is solitus. First, the aorta should be located posterior and rightward to the pulmonary valve. Second, there should be normal ventricular arterial alignment. That means that the right ventricle connects to the pulmonary valve and the left ventricle connects to the aortic valve or to the aorta. Number three, there should be a subpulmonary infundibulum. Remember, the infundibulum is a, a structure that belongs to the right ventricle. Typically, the, the normal adult heart does not have a left infundibulum. Now, the second option, inversus, still normal, but inversus is represented with the letter I. It is just a mirror image of solitus. In this case, the aorta is posterior and leftward to the pulmonary valve. The right ventricle still connects to the pulmonary valve. The LV connects to the aorta, and there is a subpulmonary infundibulum. Third letter, a little bit more complex, malposition to the left, represented with the letter L to the right with the letter D or anterior with the letter A. In this case, the location of the great arteries is off, but there is still ventricular arterial alignment is normal. The LV connects to the aorta and the RV connects to the pulmonary artery. But we don't have this this normal relation anymore, relationship anymore. Four option, transposition, meaning that there is discordant ventricular arterial alignment. And the letter D or L describe the great arterial situs. We are going to go into more detail later on. In this case, the right ventricle connects to the wrong vessel, to the aorta, and the left ventricle connects to the pulmonary artery. The vessels are transpose. We can use these two views in our normal exam, exam the RV inflow flow and the long axis to assess the great artery situs using TE. The RV inflow flow on the left shows that the aorta is posterior to the pulmonary valve, that is, that is here, the pulmonary artery also shows that the right ventricle connects to the pulmonary artery, that there is a subpulmonary infundibulum. That's why there is no 
fibrous continuity between this AV valve, which is the tricuspid valve, and the pulmonary valve because of the presence of a subpulmonary infundibulum. Now, the long axis on the right shows that the LV connects with the aorta. So there is ventricular arterial alignment, it's normal. So this is, this is, so when the segmental anatomy is normal or not inverted, we say that it is SDS, visceral atrial situs solitus, D loop ventricles, and great artery situs solitus. So, and if we go back to our original drawing that we used to represent that segmental anatomy, it will look like this one on the left. SDS, non-inverted. Right atrium, right ventricle, infundibulum, all on the right side of the patient. Left atrium, left ventricle on the left side of the patient with normal ventricular arterial alignment. SDS, non-inverted. Of course, if there is non-inverted, inverted, there must be inverted. ILI is also considered normal. It's just a mirror image of SDS, typically seen in people with situs inversus totalis, and many of them, they don't have any other, they don't have any cardiac um, um, congenital defects. This is, um, this is sorry for the quirky joke, but this it helps illustrate the point. So Samuel L. Jackson on the left and Samuel D. Jackson on the right. Still normal, right? SDS, ILI, both are normal. Okay, now back to the clinical case to determine the great artery situs. Let's see how we can do that. So the clip plane on the left will be close to a RV in throughout flow where you can see that this large left atrium drains into the morphologically right ventricle, which connects to the aorta. And we know that it is the aorta because we can follow it distally. And we see that it does not be, be bifurcates as the pulmonary artery does. Also, if you get a short axis of this valve, you will see most likely the origin of uh, the coronary artery is most likely the left main coronary artery because the right is a little bit more difficult to see. We can see that there is no fibrous continuity between this valve, which is the tricuspid valve, and this, which is the aortic, the aortic valve, because there is a sub-aortic infundibulum, which is a very, very characteristic feature in transposition of the great arteries, the presence of a sub-aortic infundibulum. Now, the second clip on the right shows that we can use different aids to help us navigate and understand anatomy. In this case, there is a wire for the impeller that is coming from the aorta, crosses the aortic valve, and goes into that systemic RV. So based on these findings, we can say that the great artery situs is transposition of the great arteries. Now, let's, let's try to get more data about the relationship of the great arteries to each other. The image on the left is an X-plane of the previous view that we just saw. The primary image, which is this one, was obtained at about 70 degrees and shows the wire of the impella crossing the aortic valve into the systemic RV. This secondary image on the right crosses the 180 degree plane line. So that's why it is inverted. So this is the right side of the patient and this is the left side of the patient. And then you see in this image that the aortic valve, you see the wire of the impella here is anterior and rightward from this pulmonary valve. So we can use here the letter D to represent that. The clip on the right shows basically the same. Now we have the impella crossing the pull the aortic valve into that systemic RV. And then you see the same, the same um, location of the semilunar valve 
aorta anterior and to the right of that pulmonary valve. So this is the schematic representation of the segmental anatomy for our patient. TGA IDD, transposition of the arteries, the situs inversus, the, the situs, the, the visceral atrial situs is inversus. That's why the morphologic left atrium is to the right. D, because the ventricles are D-loop, that's why the morphologic right ventricle is in the usual and expected location on the right side of the patient. And then D for the gray arteries, meaning that the, 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 the gray arteries are transposed, but the aorta is on the right, on the, on the right side to the pulmonary valve, it's right word. It doesn't tell anything about the anterior posterior relationship between these two great arteries. So based on this um, TGA, TGA ID description, we can infer all of the following. There is discordant atrioventricular alignment. There is discordant ventricular arterial alignment. We know that, we, we mentioned before that the AV valve typically follows the ventricle. So we know that the mitral, the mitral valve is here on the left side of the patient and the tricuspid valve is here on the, on the right side of the patient. We also know that the tricuspid valve is the systemic AV valve, right? Because it follows the right ventricle, which is the systemic ventricle. And we know that any anatomic regurg of this valve, that TR, physiologically means mitral regurgitation for this patient. There's a lot of information that we can get only from this simple description, TGA IDD. Now remember that although the cardiac position in the chest is not part of the segmental anatomy model, we have after we have drawn our own model, we can simply tilt to one side or the other. So going back to our patient, his heart within the chest will probably look like this. We can see that because he has situs inversus, D loop ventricles and dextrocardia, his LV is located anterior to that morphologic RV. And this is, this is a, a very interesting and infrequent finding. The more frequent combinations here are situs solitus with de-looping levocardia, and that places the right ventricle anterior to the LV. And the other usual combination is situs inversus with L-looping and dextrocardia. And that also places the RV anterior to the LV. So this patient has a very unusual combination of situs inversus with D-looping. That's why that this, this LV is, is anterior. All right, um, so besides all the implicit information that we can obtain from the segmental anatomy description, this is another important point. See how many different types of transposition we can find. So from left to right, this is the anatomy of our patient, TGA IDD. The second one, TGA SDD, is what we call DTGA, the most common type of transposition with cyanosis that we repair during the neonatal period. The third one, TGA SLL, is what we typically call LTGA, or ventricular inversion. Another type of transposition here. TGA ILL. But the important part is look at this, look at number one and number three. Both of, both of these are congenitally corrected transposition. But still, the description shows that the anatomy between the two of them is totally different. Remember how this patient was presented congenitally correct transposition. These two are congenitally correct transposition but the anatomy is very, very different. I would like to conclude with this. The segmental anatomy approach can be integrated to the intraoperative TEE examination 
of adult patients with congenital heart disease. Remember that those letters, those three letters represent the main cardiac segments, the atria, the ventricles, and the great arteries. Remember also that the normal segmental anatomy is either SDS, non-inverted, or ILI inverted. Both are normal. The liver is very useful to us to help us figure out the visceral atrial situs solitus. It's very easy to find with that during the TA examination. Remember that there are multiple morphologic features that will help us differentiate um, the different cardiac chambers. That includes the atrial septum, the appendages, the implantation of the AV valve uh, that we can easily assess during the, the, the TA examination. Thank you very much, and I'll um, be happy to answer any questions at the end of the presentation.